Hello, everybody. It's just gone seven o'clock. So we are going to start our webinar um, entitled Israel, My Journey, My Reality with two fantastic speakers, Nir Bakat, the former mayor of Jerusalem, and Oshra Yosef Friedman, um, co-chair of the Shared Society, Boston Haifa Connection. Uh, it is my pleasure, before we get started, to introduce you to our uh, moderator and host for the evening, Stephen Grust. Stephen Grust is the head of the African Governance and Diplomacy Program at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg and a freelance writer for the South African Jewish Report newspaper. He's hosted a magazine talk show on Chai FM, community radio station, and has made numerous radio and television appearances. Stephen holds an MSc from the London School of Economics and Political Science, oh, uh, London School of Economics and Political Science in International Relations and a BA Honours in International Relations from the University of the Advantage Fund. He's also a five-time South African Scrabble champion. So please welcome your host for the evening, Stephen Grust. Thank you very, very much, David. And uh, thank you also to the South African Zionist Federation for asking me to moderate what's going to be a fascinating discussion tonight. We're going to first go to a uh, member of Knesset, Nir Barkat, um, who we will get to in a moment. And then we'll talk to Oshra after that. And then we have a special surprise for you. We have a choir that's going to be joining us at the end of the discussions. And just to tell you a little bit about them, before we go to Mr. Barkat, they are the Yemin Orde Band, and they live in a youth village in Israel in the Carmel Mountains. They are young people from 22 different countries, uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds who are living there and being educated with the hope of becoming functioning Israeli citizens. So, and they, they I've heard their music, it's absolutely beautiful, and we're going to have um, a, a really nice musical treat for you. But first, um, to uh, member of Knesset near Barkat. Good, good evening, Mr. Barkat. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Shalom. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. So our thoughts have been with Israel over the last uh, few weeks. It's been a difficult time, I think, for everybody in Israel. And of course, also for us in the diaspora, we very much have had our hearts with what was happening. I'm hoping that June will be a better month than May was. Um, but firstly, just to, 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 to ask you, uh, Mr. Barkat, you moved from uh, high tech into politics. Tell us a little bit about your experience in the high tech world. What attracted you to, uh, to that world? And then why did you make the transition to politics and become mayor of one of the most beautiful cities in the world? Well, my, uh, my personal experience is that uh, after I served six years in the paratroopers in the Israeli army, uh, a lot of uh, extensive combat experience. I have my bachelor's in computer science in the Hebrew University. And at the tail end of school, uh, our computers were attacked by viruses, computer viruses. And so my partners and I um, developed some antivirus software and found ourselves developing a real garage operation, a real startup uh, that uh, initially we started selling in Israel, then uh, broke through to the American market and understood how to take Israeli ideas to the global marketplace. Uh, we made our first millions uh, from antivirus software and then invested uh, some of our capital in a small company called Checkpoint, uh, which is one of the largest cyber companies in the world today, uh, headquartered in, Jerusalem, in, in Israel. I was chairman of Checkpoint in its first four years and evolved to do venture capital work. And you know, when you're a venture capitalist and uh, made the uh, you know, we made some uh, of our own capital. Beverly and I, my wife and I, which is, she's South African. She migrated, immigrated to Israel when she was 10 from uh, Benoni and uh, Johannesburg. Um, we decided to invest in uh, education. And through those investments in education, I've learned some of the challenges in my own hometown, Yerushalayim. And uh, the more I got exposed, the more I realized that things uh, can work much better. Uh, and so when I was 42, that was 19 years ago, I decided to retire from my business career and focus on how to bring my skills, my entrepreneurial skills, my high tech skills uh, to public service. So I served 15 years. I served the city of Jerusalem out of which 10 years as mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, towards the tail end of my uh, mayorship, I decided not to run a third term and focus my experience and knowledge 
on the national level. And uh, next week, I'm actually proposing my vision for Israel, uh, the national uh, vision um, as a public servant. So this is where I come from, and this is what I'm doing today. So what, um, I, I, firstly, I like the way you say your first millions, because I'm yet to make my first millions. And also, uh, I'm more than 42, but I'm not able to retire from my first job. So uh, you're in a, a fortunate position, but it's amazing that you decided to give back to society to, to share your knowledge and to share your experience with uh, the citizens of, of Jerusalem. And as you say now, um, onto a national level, I mean, for me, I, I was very privileged after school to spend one year in, in Israel, of which five months was in Jerusalem. That was in the year 1990, which was the year before the um, Soviet Union disappeared and also the year before the Gulf War. And I remember very, very clearly how um, the green line was, was very visible. You could see where the old city started and the new city ended and there was no man's land in the middle. And when I was uh, very fortunate to go back to Israel a number of years later. Um, the beautiful mall that's on the outs uh, on the outskirts of the city is there. Uh, there was a light rail that that was never there in my day. I mean, what are you most proud of in in the development of the city in those ten years when you were in the mayor's seat? Oh, it's multiple um, uh, perspectives and, and ideas. I think that uh, Jerusalem has become a more attractive city, more successful in the uh, on the economic side, the, when I entered my role as mayor, the budget was three and a half billion shekels. And uh, I left when it was nine billion shekels. Uh, huge infrastructure, huge development. The things you see now, all the cranes in here are all uh, projects I started uh, sometime seven, eight, ten years ago. Um, and so I believe that uh, I'm a builder. And when you look at the, what we've built, it's not just the physical city. I've been working with Professor Michael Porter from Harvard Business School uh, in boosting Jerusalem's economy. Uh, uh, just before the corona, uh, Jerusalem was the fastest growing tourism city in the world two years in a row, and the fastest growing high-tech city in the world in, 2000, in, in uh, 2019. Uh, and so you see huge growth, huge impact on the city. Also, we yeah, I had my challenges on the security side and Jerusalem uh, is well equipped with really good uh, uh, um, um, security. If you'd like, if, if I think the word is uh, probably security, both uh, from external and internal threats. Uh, the education systems dramatically improved and I can go on and on. Uh, actually, you know, there's a very famous phrase in Hebrew, ki mitzion tetzet Torah. The Hebrew speakers probably, it means that from Zion, which is Jerusalem, new thought leadership comes to the world. And so I know from my experience that things that work in Yerushalayim are very relevant to the rest of the country and beyond. And so I'm taking that experience from Yerushalayim. And now my goal is to take it to, to, to the next level, to the phase of uh, all of Israel's periphery and all over the, the state of Israel. Um, it's interesting that you that you talk about high tech um, in, in Jerusalem, where I think the perception is often that Tel Aviv is the capital of high tech, um, uh, you know, all along the coast, uh, Silicon Wadi, et cetera. I mean, interesting, tell me a little bit more about the, the technology that Jerusalem is bringing to Israel. Yeah. Um, Jerusalem has an, a huge asset, which is called the Hebrew, uh, which is top 10 in the world in mathematics, computer science, and life sciences. And so what we did, what we did the, in my role as mayor is created the ecosystem to keep the entrepreneurs in the city. Um, because in the past, uh, the city didn't really know how to do that. And so uh, when I started my role, uh, Jerusalem had about 200 startups, similar to, to Haifa. Haifa had also 200 startups. When I finished my role, Haifa had 250 and Jerusalem, 700. We were able to attract significant amount of companies. Some of them are billion dollar companies like uh, Mobileye. Mobileye, you probably know, is uh, actually the largest uh, um, acquisition uh, in Israel's history. 
Uh, they're a Jerusalem-based company. They, they were sold for, uh, to Intel for $15 billion. Uh, and today, uh, the auton autonomous uh, vehicle research and development, the global research and development of Intel is located in Jerusalem. And we have a few companies that are really, really smart technology. It's all about uh, uh, students from the entrepreneurs that studied in the Hebrew University um, in these departments. So <clears throat> we were laser focused on things we're really good at globally and created that ecosystem and were really successful in scaling those successes to be much, much larger. We have over 3000 new engineers in Jerusalem added to the work labor force every year in the last seven, eight years, including last year, which was a tough year for the global economy. Jerusalem grew with over two and a half thousand new employees in high tech. Uh, and that is our future. And, and what do you say to the perception that uh, <clears throat> Jerusalem is, is uh, really for religious people, that, that it, it's a magnet for Mer Sharim and, and, and those sorts of areas, whereas, you know, if you really want to do business, you should be living in Tel Aviv or in Haifa. Well, Jerusalem is a microcosmos of all of Israel. And if you really want to know how Israel will look uh, two, three decades from now, uh, go take a deep look into what is happening in our city. Uh, and thank God we were focusing, when I was mayor, we were focusing on the common denominator. We had uh, 31, from 31 council members, 30 were in, in my coalition. And we focused on uh, how to make uh, the city tick better, work better. Uh, not necessarily focusing on the differences, but uh, how do we bring better education, better economy, more infrastructure. And so when you push like that, there is very little re uh, uh, objection and rejects from the public. Uh, and we were able to focus on growth rather than on, uh, on anything else. Now, that brings lots of opportunities. Uh, you know, somebody, um, I, I had a course of uh, the army and the Shin Bet and the Mossad uh, the, used to bring all, all their schools to meet me for some inspiration. And one of them, one day asked me, do I believe in pluralism? And basically I said, you know, uh, if you go to Tel Aviv and you ask people, they'll all have the same understanding of what uh, a pluralism actually means. Everyone thinks of pluralism the same. When you come to Yerushalayim, people have different perspectives on, on what pluralism really means. Uh, if you ask Haredi, uh, uh, men and women or Arabs or Christians and Muslims and secular and national religious, they all have different perspectives. And how can you put all that into one? It's a, it's a huge challenge. Uh, and that is that creates opportunities. It's not a problem. I believe that uh, um, you talk about uh, the differences in our city. It's not a bug, it's a feature. And so I look at Jerusalem as a huge opportunity to do things that one can copy all over the world. That if it works in Yerushalayim, it works everywhere else. Um, do you think? Do you think there's still rivalry between Yerushalayim and Tel Aviv? I mean, in South Africa, we we have rivalry between Cape Town and Johannesburg, and uh, uh, you know, cities have different characters. They have different uh, features and, and so forth. Uh, do you think this rivalry with uh, with Tel Aviv is uh, a healthy rivalry, or is it something that should be avoided, or you know, or, or is there no competition at all? It's no, you know, it's like soccer teams. Uh... You have to have rivalry to bring the best out of people. Uh, but I like the, I, I usually like to quote the, uh, the phrase in high tech, uh, which is co-opetition. You compete, but you also cooperate. Uh, you cooperate together because you want to create a better Israel re relative to the world. Um, and uh, you may want to compete on quality of uh, businesses. Uh, um, I competed on bringing more uh, um, of the, um, how do you say, um, more of the sports and culture to, to, to Yerushalayim. So we built the largest arena in the country. We bu built the largest soccer field uh, so that we compete well with infrastructure and opportunities uh, to Tel Aviv and other major cities in the country. 
uh, now as a, a, a parliament member, I see these initiatives as healthy because you want people to learn from peers. You want that internal competition. It drives people to uh, excellence. And I see this as a really good thing, not a bad thing. Um, last year was a very tough one uh, when the coronavirus uh, hit the world. Uh, we in South Africa have, uh, you know, thousands of cases. We're heading to a third wave. How do you think the, the virus affected the city and, and where is it now in relation to uh, overcoming it? You know, I, I think obviously something like tourism has been affected all around the world. How, how has the city been able to recover or what, are, what do you think its plans will be to, you know, uh, uh, regain that... Uh, that status of, of being the number one tourist attraction in, 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 in Israel and in that part of the world? Uh, a bit of help from the government, but more importantly, Israelis couldn't go abroad and we travel a lot. And all of a sudden Israelis found Israel as a destination for tourism. My wife and I, uh, you know, in the last year didn't go abroad even once. And when we had the opportunity, we went out to uh, different hotels in the country and uh, you know, we found out that uh, we have a beautiful, wonderful country in general. Uh, now, I don't sleep in hotels in Yerushalayim because I have somewhere better than a hotel. Uh, however, I see many, many Israelis filled in and, uh, um, you know, we survived the coronavirus and still you see more Israelis now, in you know, the, the external tourism was replaced by internal tourism. But I, I believe that now that we're the first country uh, to exit Corona safely, securely. There's many, many beautiful opportunities in Israel for business, for, for growth. Uh, the city is ready to rock and roll, lots of opportunities. Uh, I was actually yesterday, I met the mayor, the new mayor uh, and his team. We had, uh, we said goodbye to one of the employees that worked 50 years in our city. Uh, and I think the city is, uh, is gearing up, looks good. As, as the rest of the country. What we need now is stability on the national government uh, because uh, the national budget, the national government is, has been unstable for two years. So hopefully we'll get some, uh, the right government. I'm concerned we may have the wrong government, but uh, we do need stability. We may have another election, who knows, uh, you know, the fifth yeah. election in, in two and a half years. Is, um, how does that instability, do you think, uh, affect Israel on the, on the national scale? Um, you know, we in the diaspora think maybe there's too much democracy in Israel, that, uh, that you know, uh, it, it's uh, uh, going to, to four elections and maybe five elections with very similar results. Um, it, it is unstable, especially when the country faces uh, external threats like we've seen in the last in the last month? Well, it's not good. <clears throat> um, nobody's happy with the fact that uh, Israel is going through um, a real um, political and legal um, mess mm -hmm. in many, many ways. Uh, and so it does affect the people, it does affect us, uh, me in the parliament and, and others. Um, and some people say that it's better that the government's not interfering with the business life because uh, Israel's economy uh, and the export and the growth is on the fast track for growth. We may hit six percent. Seems to have frozen. Uh, we may hit six percent. Six percent. I'm there. Yeah. Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Hi, Nir. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, it looks like we might have lost Stephen. Um, we'll try to get him back. Okay, well, then I'll continue with, with your permission until he's please, back. Please, please do. Thank you. Uh, so, so I think that the biggest challenge right now is uh, how to bring calm to our country. Politically, the situation is that uh, you have two ways of looking at Israel's uh, um, politics. Um, we have about almost 80 mandates out of 120 that are right of center and 40 that are left and center. Uh, however, you've got the BB camp and the not BB camp, which is practically 50-50. 
And so right now the uh, anti-Netanyahu camp is trying to form a government and, and, and the form of the government is a little bit of right and the majority of left and center. Uh, and so the challenge is, do you create a homogeneous government with Netanyahu or do you create a heterogeneous government that uh, has little in common in terms of uh, goals uh, to replace Netanyahu? Now I'm uh, on Netanyahu's side here. So I have my own very clear uh, will and goal. Uh, but it's, that's what's been happening in the last uh, two years, back and forth, one after election after the other. And we will see how to get out of this. It's not a, it's not a healthy situation to be in. But, uh, you know, we've been in worse situations before in Israel's uh, history. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bakat. Stephen is there. There he is. Over to you, Steve. Sorry about that. Uh, we, you know, we're experiencing uh, electricity shortages in South Africa. Uh, unfortunately, something called load shedding, and uh, I think it's affecting uh, our audience and myself. So sorry uh, to have uh, to have uh, disappeared there. No um, we, we're uh, we've got a few more minutes with you, uh, Mr. Barkat. Um, what do you think? Uh, you know, what what sort of message would you give to South Africa about about Israel at at its current in its current state, and uh, you know, Jerusalem uh, as a city? You know. It, what 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 special what special you've told us a lot of what's special about it but why do you think um you know we, for, firstly actually sorry sorry about that there was a question in the in the questions which asked can south africans come and visit israel at the moment and and do you know what the restrictions are i know it's been difficult uh, for people who've wanted to make make aliyah they only limited flights i don't think el al is is flying to south africa at the moment uh, which makes it a bit more difficult so you have to go ethiopian airlines but sorry just to to ask that question is uh, uh you know is, is is israel open for tourism to south africans i i don't know the restrictions you have on uh, if, if you enter israel what kind of restrictions you have if you don't have uh, immunity and uh, didn't get your shots but I, as an Israeli, I have my, uh, uh, I got my immunes and I'm practically free to go anywhere in the world and come back home. Uh, so it depends if you've got um, your, uh, uh, your immunity. But this is something that for me is a minor detail uh, because we are slowly up, opening up to people in countries that uh, uh, have no threat, don't, don't pose any threat to Israel. Uh, so that, that would be my statement. I don't know specifically. Okay. I do know that I had uh, two dear friends from South Africa, uh, uh, Marcel and Mati Danon, that uh, they're Cape Towns. They're in Cape Town and they came to Israel for almost half a year mm. due, in, in the corona. They got their shots mm. and one of their daughters are here, is mm. here, and we spent a lot of time together in Israel. Mm. Now they're back in uh, Cape Town. Um, I know that you do have a, another meeting to get to, but I can't let you go without giving us a preview of your this vision that you're going to be unveiling uh, next week. Please tell us, you know, some of the things that uh, that you'll emphasize in that uh, in that vision. Sure. Um, well, I look at life as an entrepreneur, as a high tech entrepreneur, uh, understanding how technology and high tech could change the world. It's changing the world. And so, if I look at our uh, economy, uh, the key is expanding export. Israel today has uh, $110 billion export a year. And my goal is to get to trillion dollars a year in export. And this is something that you wanna gear up the whole country. Uh, the world is waiting for our ideas, not just in cyber and high-tech, which I come from, but also in health and, uh, uh, um, and agriculture. Uh, we've divide, defined a new term called desert tech which is how to create you know, significant better life in deserts like the Negev and the, the south of Israel. And you're gonna see us excel in areas that uh, high tech could really transform them. And my goal is to help the Israeli entrepreneurs and uh, businesses scale to the opportunity, the global opportunity. Uh, we have 9 million people, the world has 9 billion. So you got 10,000, a thousand more customers out, out there. And, and so, 
I believe that year after year by focusing on growing the export, uh, it's a strategic plan. You also want uh, to, once it rains, you want to make sure that more and more people enjoy um, the fruits of technology and, uh, and high tech. And this is something is unique. I believe we can make a huge difference in expanding the pie. Because right now, if you look at our budget, the country is too big for the current budget. We need to dramatically increase the budget and that has to be done through export. Another point is, uh, well, we have uh, unfortunately enemies uh, around us like Iran and their proxies in uh, Hezbollah in the, in the north and then Gaza, you've got uh, Hamas. Uh, and uh, they unfortunately did not change their uh, uh, charter to destroy Israel. And so we have to outsmart them. And if you look at what happened in this round of uh, violence with the rockets coming from Gaza, then you see how Israel with great technology uh, did not need to risk our soldiers. And you know, through technology and through really smart intelligence, uh, we were very, very uh, uh, targeted. Um, we were um, also very effective in, uh, in targeting the bad guys. And uh, unfortunately, one Israeli soldier died uh, or 12 Israelis were unfortunately lost their life. So if you look at our defense and our offense, they're really interwoven with technology. And we need to be very laser focused on making sure that Iran and their proxies uh, uh, were 10 steps ahead of them in terms of uh, preparations and our ability to beat them. Then there's also education uh, and health systems that have to be upgraded. And last but not least, I talk about our periphery, the Galil, the Golan, uh, the Negev, Arava, Yudav Shomron, Judea and Samaria. Uh, and how do we make those uh, uh, remote areas more attractive for young couples in, our in, in, in the future? Uh, because I want to make sure that uh, more and more young couples prefer to go to the periphery. Uh, because we have cheaper land and, and it's, it's a complex plan that I'm busy uh, uh, focusing on. And so what I'm proposing is how to make Israel a dramatically more successful place, more secure, uh, with higher quality of all of the education systems and health systems and other issues. Uh, and it's all about expanding the pie and then with a wise way uh, doing the right things. Um, fa fantastic, thank you. We look very forward to uh, hearing more about uh, Israel just growing from strength to strength to strength. Um, so if you're Hebrew speakers, uh, if some of you are Hebrew speakers, uh, we'll probably have that uh, online so you could see we're almost the same, same time zone. Yes. Uh, you'll be able to see it live if you like. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you very, very much, Nir. My um, pleasure. I see, I see you. Osh Oshra, you have your hand up. What did you want to ask uh, something to, to Mr. Barkat? Just unmute yourself. It was basically by mistake. I'm so sorry, but okay, I was no, delighted to hear no, Mr. Barkat. No Lovely problem. to see you. Mr. Barkat, thank you so much for I joining us. Thank you and keep strong. I know that your community is going through some tough times sometimes, like we do. Um, and uh, come and visit us. Uh, and we'll come visit you. I'll be, you know, once we get our act together, we'll come and say hello. Lovely. We'd love to uh, to see you when you're in South Africa. Thank you Africa. so much. That's, that's member of Knesset for the Likud Party, uh, Nir Bakat, uh, who was the mayor of Jerusalem for 10 years. And let me tell you, he only draws one shekel in salary for being a member of Knesset. So I think there are a few things you could teach our parliamentarians in South Africa. All the best. Thank you okay. so much. Bye-bye. We're, go we're going to move seamlessly into our next guest, who is uh, Oshra Friedman. Good, good evening, Oshra. Hi, how are you? I'm um, good, thank you. Where are you joining us from tonight? Um, I'm actually in my house, finally. At this time, usually I, I would be on the road, uh, but this time I'm in Haifa, nearly Haifa. Okay, lovely. My, my brother has just moved to Haifa and uh, they're really enjoying the lifestyle there. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, a wonderful a, it's a beautiful city. city. It's a yeah. beautiful city. But we'd, what I want to do is, is really your, your Israel um, and your Israel experience is uh, a different one to, to uh, Nir Barkat's. Uh, you came to Israel as part of Operation Moses. Um, I believe you were seven years old. What do you remember about right. those days? What, tell, me, tell me the story. 
Oh, I remember everything, but it's going to take you the whole hour that you were planning for this program. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> um, but I will say that I arrived to Israel when I was seven. Um, I always knew that our house is going to build up in Jerusalem, which I was happy about it since I was young. My parents um, um, were really working really hard to make sure that we'll be able to survive the road and um, and arrive finally. Um, if if I'll just keep little little uh, bit of the story, say that yes. you know you li you live in a very small village, wonderful village, a very good life, but not really um, able to practice Ju Judaism um, uh, freely and safely, and then to decide one night that, that it's our turn to take the journey and walk for three weeks to Sudan and spend a year in the refugee camp and then arrive to Jerusalem in Israel, which we didn't know that it's not Eretz Israel because we always dream about Jerusalem of gold and find out that you have to build the whole entire life from the beginning, just from a scratch, uh, whether it's a, a language, a culture, a society and learning the system and, and make sure that your whatever you brought with us uh, supposed to be fit into new society that you're going into and what kind of struggles you you have to deal with and i think for for everyone who is a new immigrant or even uh, um you know it can be here for 30 years it doesn't matter the best memory is the first impression that you have on the first time that you meet uh the new country and and i was curious i was curious about the Israeli society. I was curious about Judaism uh, to find out that there is a uh, white Jewish as much as black Jewish. It's a fascinating thing. And also know that um, there is Eretz Israel and not, Jerus not just Jerusalem as we dreamed of. And at the same time also to understand that whatever we were dreaming about, it's not really um, suitable to the fact and the reality and how you you handle that, how you you actually make sure that even though your dream is kind of breaking down, how you build from that thing, something new that you can really believe because visions and dreams uh, that become true can be really um, a very traumatic thing on one hand and also a very successful thing on the other hand. And um, I'm the youngest from 13 kids. Uh, we, we arrived only with nine kids. We lost some on the way. And to see my parents struggling and for me becoming part of the Israeli society, which is a huge uh, difference and, and a, a very big gap to close, I think this is something that um, I can relate to it when every time there is a new Aliyah coming in and I say, oh, I have the tools to give you, you know, kind of a preparation that I can make for you. Um, so this is how I see it. So, so just take us a, a back a little bit. You said you walked from from Ethiopia. Where, where about was your village? Which village did so you come from? So my village was in in Wizawa next to Gondor. Um, okay. um, so we had a guy. My my brothers uh, two years before we took the journey. They already came to Israel, uh, but we didn't have any connection with them because they wasn't able to do that. Um, and then my dad decided that uh, since the whole entire village is trying to walk uh, and take the journey, it will be a good time for us to do. So, you know, we left everything behind and we just took the road. Um, and when I say take the road, it's not a bus and it's not a car. We have only one donkey, but a very, very, very strong uh, spirit and feet and um, a dream that hold us uh, through the way. Um, I can... I can honestly say that there were people who start the journey with us, but they didn't survive the journey. And um, probably some of them who, were, who did, each one of them lost a few kids or a family member in that way or another. And um, this is something that you, you, you're really taking with you the whole way. Uh, that's that's difficult uh, when you when you lose people you love. But I mean, the dream must have been so powerful to to leave Ethiopia to be prepared to. Did you say you were in Sudan for a year in a refugee camp? I mean, what was what was that like a for a, yeah, for, a, for an camp. eight year for an eight year old girl? Um, that must have been tough. Well, it was it was horrible. Um, I was six and I arrived to a refugee camp. Um, so after a year, I came to Israel. And I think 
I don't think people realize what what it means when we talk about refugee camp and how big it is in the middle of the desert when everybody is actually coming uh, to keep themselves safe, um, not be able to practice Judaism at the refugee camp, uh, keeping Shabbat uh, really, really dedicated, uh, not just showing something that um, can make you a little bit on a risk uh, that way or another. Um, I was a very curious person. I was, you know, everything is interesting. Uh, so I'm asking questions and making my own uh, team of uh, investigating and see what is happening at the camp and realizing that this is going to be our home for the next year. Um, and we should, you know, settle down and see what is going to happen. But also seeing um, not a very Pleasant uh, things and situations when people are passing away and there's no place to come. I won't say um, a war or fight, but disagreement and how you solve that without making sure that they know that you are Jewish and you are here just for certain reason. Uh, and also people that you lose on the way because the, the camp is so big, it's, it's huge. I mean, I wouldn't even have a picture how to describe this. Um, and I think this is things that make you, whether it's a very strong person or it can, you know, make you really weak and not be able to bear the whole situation. So how did you get from Sudan then to Israel? Uh, after a year, we flew to Israel. After five hours, we landed in Jerusalem. And there's a huge picture that everybody who's, who who hear about the Ethiopian immigrant story see that the parents come out from the plant and they, you know, uh, knee down to the floor and kiss the land, which is amazing picture. But there's one picture that people don't see, and that is what the kids do in the meantime. And as a kid, since we have been told that it's Jerusalem is full of gold, we were looking for the gold. But there's no picture for that. The only picture that you see is that our parents kissing the land because they make the dream come true. Um, so for me, that was a very new experience. But also, you know, when you don't explain to a new immigrant how life in a new country should lo look like, and you make the whole bunch of mistakes, and you, um, as, as a new immigrant who wanted to be part of the Israeli society, I, I basically needed to actually smash my whole identity and built it all over again just to be belong to the Israel society. And over the years, I learned that that was a huge mistake because that wasn't supposed to be. I mean, I have a, a very good values and education that I bring with me from background. And I need to make sure that this new uh, culture that I'm going into will be able to respect and, uh, and, and be able to give me the opportunity to be part of the divisor diversity population in the country without even uh, make me feel uncomfortable or not belonging in any any other way that you can call it. And, and it took us a while to build that. For our parents, it was something like, we should thank God that we are here and we make our dream come true, but not really talking about this struggle, their disappointment maybe, not being able to work because back in Ethiopia, you could work anytime and every year, year after a few years, you know, you you became like a um, uh, pension, you, you get a pension to just not work. And this is something that not, uh, it's not really suitable. Mm. Um, so I think those little things is something that um, that we, sh we should work, uh, keep continue working on that um, for every new group that is coming to Israel or any other country, it doesn't matter. So for, for my work, I, I often travel to Ethiopia. I've been to Addis uh, many, many times, uh, probably 10 or 12 times over the last few years. And, and one of the things I do if I'm there over Shabbat is I look for, uh, I, I've attended the Chabad uh, shul that's in Addis and you have to find the, the, the little alleyways and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Go there for Shabbat, and 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 sometimes there are Ethiopians who have been living in Israel um, have come back to Ethiopia to just discover a little bit more about their culture. And uh, at both times when I was there for Shabbat dinner, we had an amazing right. conversation with uh, Israeli Ethiopians who were who were coming back and trying to reconnect to that side of their identity. Um, I wanted to ask you um, that 
what you know, I, I, my understanding is that there were about forty thousand Ethiopians that came to to Israel, and today there are about one hundred and forty thousand. I know there was recently, at the beginning of this year, a yet another flight of uh, immigrants of you know the last small communities right, that are now right. still coming to still coming to Israel um, uh, even today. Uh, can you tell us just in the few minutes that we've got left a little bit of a, a flavor of the Ethiopian community and the Ethiopian experience in Israel? Uh, or, uh, <laughs> um, there, there, there is one thing that, um, you know, when, when you are on the or, or a board, you see and you read through the media in any form what is happening with the Ethiopian community and who is bringing who and how many are arriving every time. Uh, one of the dilemma that I used to have uh, many years ago is why when someone recognized uh, being Jewish and he wants to arrive to Israel, why not to bring them all of them and close the gap? And in, instead of leaving families apart for so many years. And I think this is something that is um, really worked out really nice uh, lately, but we still have, uh, you know, a lot of work to go through. Um, I think in the Ethiopian community, it's, uh, it's really divided to two to three groups, you can say three different generations. The generation of our parents satisfied and no one, they will never um, criticize any any part that is wrong for them. They, they will uh, respect and, and probably will deny that something is really wrong is happening or, or being hurt. And the second generation is the generation of my age and my brothers who have been uh, studying here and went to school and served the army and went to high school and, um, and universities, et cetera, who have the knowledge to sit down and have this um, uh, conversation of how we can help in order to make the situation much better, to show the tradition and the culture, because every time, you know, it's, look at your neighbors. You, you can always ask, what do I know about my neighbor? And what does he know about me? Because sometimes we forget to talk to each other. And so, sometimes we, not sometimes, all of us are really judging others and having these kind of stereotypes. And when we, once we sit down and talk to each other, we'll find out that there's a lot of co in common instead of something, you know, make the difference. And, and so my generation and my brother's generation is actually based on that fact, saying that we know what, how the two system, two cultures, the two, the two different societies are talking to each other or thinking about each other. And we are capable to build this bridge to make sure that um, you know, both sides will be able to talk because at the end of it, we are talking about one society. There is no others. There, there will be diverse groups, but still it's the Israeli society at the end of it. And there's the new generation who have been and raised in Israel and their parents might be academic or even my brother's generation and they feel equal. But there's one thing when you come to talk about racism and stereotypes and judgment, but there's one thing that the Ethiopian community cannot deny and it's the skin of the color and how you can change that, how you make sure that people will be able to see beyond, beyond the skin color, beyond of that, making sure that you give the opportunities to everyone. And this is the system that we are working on in, on every daily basis. Let's say I volunteer, I, I choose where I wanna volunteer and I volunteer as a co-chair at the Share Society in Haifa Boston Connection. Um, and one of the things that we are working is making sure that there is a, uh, a very respect and, 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 and inclusion uh, discussion about uh, vulnerable population in Haifa, how we make sure that each one of the groups uh, will be able to connect to each other and how we help them to build up their life next, not just because we are the one who are privileged to do it, just because we have a little bit of experience, but nothing that we are going to do is not going to be able to be done without them. They are part of the uh, of the activities that we are create, creating. I think in the end of it, I would say that as a new immigrant, as a very uh, Israeli Zionist Jew, as you can hear, I can say that at the end of it, I do believe that um, humans are really, really, really 
amazing. At the end of it, it's up to us. It's our responsibility to take part and choose where we want to change, where we want to make our impact, where why we don't stand by when something wrong is happening, how we create this system that will be able to give you a very safe area to, to walk around and talk and share your thoughts without making sure that someone is not going to shut you up. And, um, and, and I do believe on working together. I do believe that we have a society with lots of pieces of puzzle. And if you take one of them, something is going to miss and it's not going to be really whole. And I think there's no question of the contribution that uh, Ethiopian Jews have made to Israel. Um, I think they are a very important part of the society. And uh, like every immigrant group, they bring their own culture, they bring their own food and customs, and it just makes that tapestry that is Israel uh, all the more appealing and all the more interesting. Osha, I could have talked to you the whole night. I would love to hear more of your story, but uh, unfortunately we are, we are out of time. So I just want to say a big thank you for, for joining us. It's been a pleasure and uh, we look forward to, uh, maybe you'll come to South Africa one day and we'll have you for Shabbat dinner. Okay, thank you. It will thank be my love to, to do that. It will be a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank You're you, welcome. Ashra. I'm not going to. You're, uh, welcome. Uh, You're welcome. We're now going to turn to the choir. Just to remind you again, this is the Yamin Order Band uh, who are going to be singing for us live. They live in a youth village in Israel in the Carmel Mountains, and they are young people from 22 different countries from disadvantaged backgrounds who are living and being educated there with the hope of becoming committed citizens of Israel and the best people that they can possibly be. So David, if we can spotlight onto the choir, uh, we're gonna, we'll do that and then I'll, I'll end off. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, there we go, I'm gonna spotlight you. Over to you guys. Hello, we are German from Yemenau School and we are going to sing you a song about peace.
Thank you very, very much, uh, Ode. That was really beautiful um, coming to us live from Israel uh, through a mobile phone. So um, thank you very, very much. We really enjoyed uh, listening to you. Um, and that's that's going to be it for the evening. Uh, David, I don't know if there are any final announcements, but uh, thanks to the Zionist Federation for putting on tonight. We had uh, well over 150 people who were in attendance, and uh, I'm not sure if there are any further announcements, Dave. Thank you very much, Stephen, and no further announcements except to say thank you so much to yourself for facilitating such a fantastic discussion and our choir in Israel who were just amazing, really, really added uh, uh, a bit of uh, spirit and uh, love to the proceed to proceedings. Um, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to everyone for joining us and we will see you next time. Have a good evening, everybody.